Alrighty folks, and welcome to the Chronicle Podcast Channel. Episode 29, The Eastern Han Dynasty. Now before I go on with the, the topic of today's episode, I will say I'm very sorry for not really being active on social media or anything lately, and as well as that, obviously missing last week's episode. But the reason why was because I did feel pretty terrible last week. I don't know what it was, it was just, well, what I think it is, was that basically the end of the semester has come in in my school and I've been so worked and probably overworked trying to help the students get to their final exams and stuff, making sure they complete their homework, making sure they're understanding the topics I'm teaching them and stuff. And it's been a hectic year. It's my first year teaching at high school, like, level, so it was a very challenging year. And because all of it's beginning to slow down now, I think my body just felt exhausted. So that's why you've not heard from me, or you've not even, like, seen any new episodes from me or anything. That's the reason why. And I do have some good news, but I will talk more about it later on, well, at the end of this episode. But for now... On with the show. So I'm hoping to cover the Eastern Han Dynasty in one podcast. (laughs) Boy, this is going to be tough. But I will do my best. I think the best way to break this down is to discuss the aftermath of uh, the death of uh, Wang Mang, the golden age that soon followed, and then the corruption that resulted from said golden age, which then led on to rebellions, and one in particular where all of the rebels wore yellow scarves. But first, the Eastern Han period lasted from around 25 AD until uh, 220 AD, and it is called the Eastern Han because when the Liu family took over once again, the new emperor, Liu Xiu, moved the capital away from Chang'an and moved it over to Luoyang. However, how did the Han Empire become restored? Well, Let's go back a bit and look at the death of Wang Mang. When Wang Mang was trying to, and failing to, deal with the Red Eyebrow Rebels, many remnants of the Liu family took advantage of the situation and began to rise up with their own rebellions. After the rebels decapitated Wang Mang, they immediately installed a child on the throne. His name was Liu Pengzi, who was a member of the Liu family. In order to restore the Han, The rebels were seen as the heroes of the common people, who had restored order to the world. However, that soon quickly fell apart. Due to the centralised nature of the rebels, they soon quickly fought amongst themselves, abandoned the politics and with that the capital, and they just simply went home. It makes sense. I mean, if you're a rebel, just a regular guy, like, you don't really care about the politics. You cared about the famines and stuff that was happening under the rule of Wang Man. And now that he's dead, you could just think, well, job done. So that's basically what happened. But of course, factions uh, began to emerge within the rebels, and yeah, it quickly fell apart. Anyway, as the rebels began to disperse, there were two main rivals for power who rose up, both of whom were members of the Liu family. On one hand was the brothers Liu Yen and Liu Xiu, and on the other was Liu Xuan. And it was Liu Xuan who got there first. He acted first and became the emperor Han Gong Shu Di, and to be frank, he wasn't good at his job. His pitiful reign only lasted two years between 23 to 25 AD, and because of the short reign, it's rather self-explanatory. He sent out generals to fight off rebels and remnants of supporters of Wang Man, and left the governing to officials. So what could he do as emperor? Well, party, of course. And it is said that he indulged in a lot of pleasures. What also didn't help is that Emperor Gong Shu Di basically didn't know how to rule properly. And as each month passed by, he grew more and more isolated. Now it's important to note that the red eyebrows were still at large during this time and the emperor was simply unable to deal with them. Amongst all of this chaos and his growing paranoia of his fellow cousin Liu Yen, Liu Xuan made a critical error by having him assassinated. 
So whilst Emperor Gong Shu Di was fumbling his way through Chinese court politics and making a mess of everything, Liu Xiu, the younger brother of Liu Yan, was working behind the scenes, building up supports, all geared toward revenge for his brother's defeat. Now you might be thinking that I said revenge in a sarcastic way, and I kinda did, as the two brothers were also competing against each other for power, albeit not blatantly, but nonetheless they were competing. Evidence of this is the separate groups forming around the two contenders. But again, stupidly, Liu Xuan left Liu Xiu alive. Why would he do that? Don't spare anyone if you're assassinating potential rivals. However, from everyone else's point of view, it was actually a good thing, as Emperor Gong Shu Di was overthrown by those troublesome red eyebrows, and just when everyone thought the country was about to fall to chaos again, it was Liu Xiu who appeared and proclaimed himself emperor. A brilliant military strategist, Liu Xuan bided his time and waited for the right time to strike. And why not let the rebels and imperial forces battle out, and then he could take advantage of the situation? By 25 AD, Liu Xiu had swooped through the Yellow River, defeated the Red Eyebrow rebels, and then took over the mess. Luckily, Liu Xiu wasn't an idiot, and slowly accumulated his power at Liuyang. The other warlords, or members of the Liu family who had claimed power, were all gradually brought to heel over his early reign. Once power was firmly within Liu Xiu's grasp and peace finally restored by 36 or 37 AD, Liu Xiu granted himself the title Emperor Guangwu Di. Emperor Guangwu reigned for 32 years altogether and brought order back to the empire. For example, he managed to lower taxes and allowed the economy to recover, which set the stage for his son and successor, Emperor Ming Di, to bring about the Han Dynasty's second golden age. It was during the reign of Emperor Ming that Buddhism began to be accepted in China, and I will more than likely do a separate podcast on that, but for now, let's get back to the Eastern Han. Emperor Ming and his successor, Liu Da, or Emperor Zhang, ushered in the Han Dynasty's second golden age. One of China's four great inventions as well was invented during this time. It was something that even gets used right up to this very day. Think about the time where you're in class or whenever you phone the bloody bank because something else has went wrong, you always have a notepad next to you. Well, you can thank the Han eunuch Tai Lun for that as he experimented within the imperial palace and found a way of processing hemp to make high quality paper. This truly was revolutionary, as beforehand the nobles within China wrote on scrolls of bamboo. Now I don't know if you know this, but if you're an emperor and govern an empire, uh, bamboo slips become extremely heavy. Qin Shi Huang is even said to have noted how many decrees he wrote purely based on the amount of weight, which was at least 50 kilogram, of edicts. That's a hell of a lot. But with the invention of paper, well that means the bureaucracy can actually function so much more effectively and quickly, as a piece of paper is lighter than a scroll of bamboo. Don't get me wrong, the bureaucrats still like to keep their traditions, so they did wrap the paper in slips of bamboo, but just to protect the contents inside it. But still, if it it was a big spiel about something, It still only required one slip of paper folded into one bamboo scroll, rather than thousands of slips of bamboo. With the bureaucracy doing so well, everything else seemed to recover from the interregnum period. The economy was booming once again, corruption had been rooted out, and even some territories, which were pretty much abandoned during the time of civil war, were retaken. All seemed all good and well for the Eastern Han. But what comes up must eventually come crashing down. With time being the killer of any empire, it seemed the Han Dynasty's time was up. For starters, the same bureaucracy that did so well in revitalising the Han, over time became more corrupt. Powerful factions began to emerge within the Han court, and in particular, the eunuch faction. The eunuchs were not supposed to be involved in any politics whatsoever, but as time went by, 
the Han emperors began to listen to the eunuchs over his ministers more and more and more. Beforehand, in times of famine, the imperial government handed out grain, allowed peasants to hunt on the hunting grounds of the nobility, and lowered taxes. Whereas, towards the end of the Eastern Han Dynasty, if there was a famine, taxes were actually increased, and no grain was given to the peasants either. All of the money that should have went to relieve the people began to mysteriously disappear, and the eunuchs, all of a sudden, had palaces almost as big as the emperor's. I'll let you do the math, but you know what happened to that money. The central bureaucracy was paralysed by its own corruption. It's safe to say that all it took was a little spark to ignite the fires of rebellion, and it happened when there was a succession crisis at court. And then the rebellion, led by Taoist magician brothers, the Zhangs, Followers of the Three Brothers began to wear yellow scarves around their heads, and the rebellion became known as the Yellow Turban Rebellion, or in Chinese, Huangjin Qi Yi. The Han Dynasty, surprisingly, were surprised by this rebellion, which is just insane, considering how things were going at this point in history. The rebellion gained a huge amount of momentum, and by 184 AD, many followers flocked to the cause. The Han Dynasty responded in a uniquely stupid way. They didn't really have an army to deal with the uprising, as it was way off in the frontiers, so the dynasty had to rely on local strongmen, or basically feudal lords, to clean up the mess. The rebellion was instantly cleared away by the likes of Tal Tal, Liu Bei, and Sun Jian, to name a few. Now keep those three names in mind, they are very famous in China even today and you can guarantee I will talk about them in more depth in the future. The rebellion was completely crushed by 185 AD. The warlords were better equipped, trained and just smarter than the rabble of farmers, literally with farming tools rather than weapons. Despite the war only lasting a year though, over 1 million people died as a result of this rebellion. Now, the Han Dynasty faced an even larger problem. The very warlords who they sent to crush the rebellion. Everyone who participated in the military action against the rebels knew that the Han Dynasty was on its last legs and tried to gain more power for themselves whilst all saying they were fighting for the Han Dynasty. So it would be like, this guy wants to usurp power, kill him, and it went around like that. All it took was, oh, I don't know, something like a succession crisis? The Emperor's dead with two sons and they are not of age, you say? Hallelujah! It soon became a free-for-all, and many warlords rose up fighting for control of the realm. There were so many lords that I could mention, and it would make Game of Thrones look like a children's book, to be honest. However, I'm not going to do that here. I'm just going to skim over this just now, and then explain the complexities of what happened in the future episodes. Considering we are dealing with the Eastern Han Dynasty alone with this episode, I kind of want to keep it related to the Eastern Han. The final nail in the coffin was when one of these warlords, a man named Dong Zhuo, swept in from Xilian in the northwest and took control of the imperial family. Dong Zhuo killed the older of the two brothers and then put the young Han Emperor on the throne, then named himself Chancellor. A reign of terror sweeped through the imperial court, and nobody dared defy the mad general. This is when we begin to see the emergence of the Three Kingdoms period, and my episodes are going to kind of overlap here. But suffice it to say, Dojo got his comeuppance, and it is here that the young emperor would fall into the hands of Talta, and he would remain a puppet of the Tal family up until he was deposed by Talta's son. Talpi in 220 AD. Almost 400 years of rule, two golden ages, new inventions, and a time of relative peace during that time, apart from a few blips, was all over. You'd think the emperor would have went out with a bang, but actually it was already clear that the Han Dynasty was long gone, and the Three Kingdom period had officially begun. Now you must be thinking, Dino, you have completely skimmed over the rebellion and everything else after the Han began to decline. And yes, you are right. But there is a reason for this. 
I believe that the Yellow Turbans deserve their own episode, as it is going to be a major contributor to the fall of the Han Dynasty. So I want to go in more depth as to the ins and outs of the rebellion and how it got crushed. Then, once that is aside, it will set up quite nicely for the Three Kingdoms era. For the Three Kingdoms, I am actually unsure on how to approach it. On one hand, I love the book, Romance of the Three Kingdoms. But on the other, this is a Chinese history podcast, not a Three Kingdoms one. So I don't think it's fair to spend so much time on a period that only lasted around 80 years, when China's history lasts 5,000. It's a numbers game here, so what I will do is explain the Three Kingdoms period, discuss what happened and its legacy, and then move on. However, with future episodes, and particularly once I've covered all of the different dynasties in China's history, I will definitely be revisiting the Three Kingdoms period and going more kind of like a romance mode on it. Now, I did say at the beginning of the episode that I did have some exciting news. And the exciting news is that with the holidays coming up, I'm finally going to find myself having enough time to be moving the podcast episode onto the YouTube platform. Now, the reason why I've not done it is just because I've just not had time. I've not had time to, you know, make the video and post on YouTube. But now that the semester is over and the summer holidays beginning, I will be able to do that. And speaking of YouTube, I'm actually going to be traveling through China. Well, not all of China, but for a month, I'm going to be traveling through China. So what that does mean is that there won't be any future podcast episodes in the next five weeks or so. But what it does mean is that there will be lots of video content on my journey through China, looking at the history, And the first stop that I'm going to be going on will be Shanghai. So please be sure to be uh, keeping an eye out on my social media platform to be sure that you can see all of the things that I will be showing you on my trip through China for the next four weeks. Now, I hope you've enjoyed this episode. Thanks for listening.